certificates of participation. Um, the survey is important because um, we take your feedback and make adjustments to the course. And there's a few of you who've been in the workshop for other previous years and you'll know that we... Um, sorry for that slight delay. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Guillaume Book. I actually work at the McGill Genome Center in Montreal, and I'm responsible for bioinformatics platform there and all of the analysis. So I'll be um, well covering the two modules this morning that deal with uh, small variant calling and annotation, and then also structural variant. Um, you, you'll see that there's quite a bit of link with what you did yesterday. So I trust that you all had. Um, a good time yesterday and learned a lot and you'll see so I'm gonna make a lot of, of back and forward references to things that you've seen yesterday and you'll see the actual impact that some of the steps that you've done um, on, on varying calling as part of my module so um, let's get started so so the objectives of, of this first module this morning is, is to really get uh, an overview of, of the variant calling analysis workflow right so uh, that's, that's really the key uh, message for, for this particular uh, module. So we want to, to understand the basic principles of variant calling, know what effects and how we can improve variant calls. Uh, once you actually have the variant calls, learn how you can filter and annotate those variants. Um, and, 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 and then in the practical, we'll actually go through all of that. So, um, you know, in, in so we'll sort of split the time between really going over the general principles and then uh, in the lab you'll actually uh, go, we'll go through the steps and, and, and do it. Um, so and then you know one of the links to, to what you've seen yesterday is that we're going to be using IGV in parallel to really look at, at the results. Um, okay so so this is a, a a simplified view of, of uh, variant calling and, and how the, the various steps that are associated with variant calling. Uh, so at the top, uh, you have. Oops, I know. There we go. So at the top, you have um, just you know looking at the raw reads and, and, and in some case trimming. So we'll go over that a little bit. Uh, you've done as part of module two really uh, many of these steps that are the alignment so, so first step so you look at the data you clean the data in some case you align all the reads onto the genome so this is the, ma the main alignment step uh, and then and then you can do the, the actual variant calling um, in parallel to that you, there's you know there's going to be all sorts of statistics that that can be generated um, so so another way of looking at this so again, it's really a, a sort of a workflow of analysis. Um, you're looking at the, at the reads. Um, mapping uh, the reads is, is really what you did as part of module two. Uh, and, then, and then you get to the variant calling itself. So this is what we're going to be doing this morning. Uh, and then also the structural, the larger variants, which we'll cover in module six. Uh, so so before, before I jump in uh, module five, uh, I want to cover just a little bit uh, some aspects, uh, some additional aspects of quality control and pre-processing uh, because in some case this, and not in some cases, in, in all cases, uh, this will have an impact on the variant calling itself. So, so it's pretty important that, uh, to, and so again, some of these things were discussed already yesterday, but given the, how important it is, I wanted to uh, go over some of these uh, messages again. Um, so, so it's really quite critical, uh, you know, so when you're doing bioinformatic analysis, just like if you're working in the lab, that you actually, you know, look and follow each step and, 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 and do some control and quality control at every step of your analysis. Uh, and that's the first step of uh, looking at the raw data uh, before you run through a whole pipeline and run through a whole series of, of uh, of, of uh, command lines or commands is really really important. Um, so so you want to be able and, and so again you, you've covered that a little bit, um, but but I want to reemphasize that that's quite critical that you know to know where the samples that you're going to be analyzing are coming from, um, 
you know, where they use, where they, so especially if you're going to be doing a comparison of different samples, you know, where they all sent se sequence at the same time using, you know, similar protocols, similar to the same instruments. Uh, are there any technical issues that are affecting some of the sample? Um, so, I mean, you, you, sh you should have uh, a, a very good idea of, you know, an answer to all of these questions basically before you jump in and you start doing uh, the, uh, the variant analysis. So, um, and yeah, and, and in most cases, you're going to be comparing multiple samples and not just one. So, I mean, this is quite, quite relevant. So, um, so you've seen, or this tool was mentioned already uh, yesterday, but uh, so, so a pretty critical tool um, that's used quite a bit, I think. Uh, there's an alternative tool, but this one already, uh, you know, packages many, uh, many components uh, that uh, allow quality control. Uh, it's FastQC. Um, so, so this in the practical, again, before we actually go through uh, the variant calling step, we'll actually run the samples themselves uh, through this tool, and 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 you can look at them, uh, you know, look at the specific results. So the sample that we're going to be analyzing in the lab uh, actually looked quite good. So this is this is one example of the read. Um, so you see that the typical profile where um, this is the quality scores of the reads per base, and you see that the quality, although goes goes down, overall the profile is is, is quite good. And so I mean it's too small to actually see the values, but you see that the, the quality of the read is quite good. So you have all sorts of different metrics that you can look at. Uh, this this is a particular view that shows where on the slide. Uh, the, 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 read, the quality of the reads depending on their position on the slide and you see again uh, you know all of the all, all green and, and, and yellow which is which is a good sign. Um, the second read uh, on, on, on again one of these data sets that we're going, that we're going to be studying in the practical uh, you know is also pretty good uh, but there is one thing that's flagged which in, in, you know for most this is still overall quite good, but you, you get a sense that so the, the information of the per tile quality values, sort of there are some regions in the tile that had overall lower quality uh, score. So that you know already sort of indicate that maybe it's still I mean in this case it's still quite good, uh, but again if you if you're going to be comparing multiple sample, uh, it is a good idea to 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 you know, double check some of them or go back after you've called if you see that you have lots and lots of variants. Yeah? Can you just repeat the definition of those tiles? Yes, so I, I guess I'll, I'll get to that. So yeah, so so depend, So there's lots of, depending on the patterns that you see uh, from these results, then you can definitely trim or, or remove uh, the, the, you know, based on, I mean, one challenge to, to, be, to be honest, when you look at this, I mean, again, these are very good reads. You'll frequently get, uh, you know, so profile where you you have some red, right? And then it's like, is this a problem or is it, it's not a problem? Um, again, I think it's, it's for the most part the variant calling itself will be robust to some of these you know uh, slight slightly lower quality reads. Um, but it, it's really a question of seeing, for instance, if if one of the sample has a horrible profile compared to the other ones, you want to know that up front before you start doing all the variants. Um, so, so this is, I, I, you know, I put the emphasis here on the quality of the reads. Uh, so, I, but again, I mean, even if you sequence, you, you get sequences from, from the genome center where I work, I mean, don't trust us, look at the reads that we send you, right, before, before you, uh, you start your analysis. So the quality score is one thing. Um, in some cases, there's the presence of adapter sequences uh, in your reads and then uh, that, that's another thing. I mean, this is a, I guess, an old figure of a Selexa read. But basically, um, in the in the sequencing process, you'll have you have adapters that are ligated to the sequence that you uh, you're interested in. In some cases, the read actually you know goes into the adapter. So looking for adapter sequences in your reads is another thing um, to to watch out for. Uh, that would be flagged by a tool like FastQC. Um, so um, so, so looking for an overrepresentation of uh, of sequences 
uh, <clears throat> this also can be an indication that there was a problem with the, the sample that you're, you know, that you're looking at. Um, so, so what happens to, to, to answer your question, and, and please don't hesitate if you have other questions, but to answer your question, if you do identify issues with some of your read, there's lots of, of, of tools, Trimomatic is, is one of them, there are many others that actually allow you to, um, to, to remove some reads or, or trim some of the reads. Um, but, you know, one thing that used to be quite common was to, to trim from the end of the read that typically are lower quality. So you would actually uh, uh, start trimming your reads from, from the three prime end uh, based on different quality metrics. Um, so, so again, you know, it, for most purpose, actually reads now are, are very high quality and, and it's not as necessary um, to, to trim the reads. Uh, because again, the, the downstream variant caller will be robust to having some uh, lower quality reads and will still be able to, to have high accuracy. But this is still something to keep in mind, again, given that uh, in some case you might have some samples that are older or lower quality. Okay, so this was really, uh, again, just a uh, just a sort of an introduction and warm up uh, before we jump into the actual variant calling. Um, so again, um, so I'm, I'm, you know, you've covered the mapping quite extensively yesterday. Um, what, so, so, but I'll go back to some components that were presented in the context of the mapping module uh, to explain and show the impact that those have on variant calling. Um, so this, um, so I'm talking about variant calling, variant calling. So, I mean, maybe I should have had this slide first. This is really the goal of this, this module, right? So we, if it's quite small, I hope you can see or on the, on, the, on the handout, but this is a view from IGV. At the top, you have uh, potentially a, a tumor sample. Uh, you see all of the reads and they all have um, a difference, or most of them have a difference at a particular position, uh, and this contrasts with the, the normal uh, sample from the same individual where all the reads actually map that reference uh, genome. So um, this is really the information that we want to be extracting from, from all of the reads. So we've mapped them, uh, and now we want to be able to distinguish uh, cases like this where there's clearly a difference, right? I mean, you don't even need a, a fancy algorithm uh, to, to, to identify that uh, there's clearly a difference at this position in this sample relative to, to the reference. And this contrasts with, with the sequencing errors that are more randomly distributed and are sort of uh, much more sparse uh, and are, are spread uh, throughout. So this is what, what we're after, right? So how do we extract this systematically from, from our data. Um, so this is a, an, another representation, more cartoonish representation of the same thing. Um, so all of these are reads. Uh, we want to be able to detect whether they're, they're SNPs, whether they're variants or they're, they're somatic mutation. Uh, we want to find positions where multiple reads are supporting uh, uh, the fact that this is a, a, a variant relative to the reference and distinguish that from the, the sequencing errors that we expect to be uh, sort of randomly distributed, as I said. Um, so there's, there's, you know, so, so we'll be using a few things. I mean, one of the things that we'll be using to actually call variants will be multiple, you know, the amount of reads that are supporting a change. Uh, so multiple reads uh, supporting, that, that'll be one piece of information. We're also going to be using the base quality itself. So that's why I, I was saying actually most recaller, uh, variant caller, I'm sorry, um, the trimming step is less critical because you do take into account the base quality of the base within the read to actually, uh, whether it's supporting a variant or not, such that lower, so, um, so, so we can make use of the fact that with every read and every position, there is a quality score that's associated to how clear the signal was, uh, and we can embed that in, in the variant calling, or the, the variant calling algorithm uh, uses that information. Um, so in other words, 
you know, reads that actually are calling a variant with a high quality score will be weighted upward, you know, more, more strongly than, than when the base itself within the read was already also ambiguous. Um, so I've, I've actually, the next slide is slightly different from, from what you have in your handout. And that's, uh, so that's, and that's pretty much the only equations that I'll be showing in this, but I, I wanted to at least scare you a little bit, right, in terms of, uh, you know, so this is not going to be part of the practical per se, uh, but again, this so there's there's a number of variant caller. Um, we're going to be using uh, the GATK variant calling uh, variant caller, um, but but most of them work on on some of the the same principles. So that's why I wanted to at least you know give you a sense of what uh, those principles you know are. So so most of the variant caller are using. Um, this Bayesian modeling, they, they view this as a Bayesian uh, problem where, you know, you've got all of this data and what is the probability of a particular genotype given that data? Uh, so again, I mean, this is not, you know, we, we don't need to go into that too much, but, you know, what we're interested in is knowing the probability of a, the, the genotype being a variant given the, all of the read data that we have. Uh, and, and what this does is really, you know, so, well, Again, it's not so, so critical. The Bayesian rule actually reversed the problems and says, you know, you given a, a given genotype, what's the probability of the data? Um, and then you, you you integrate over all the possibilities. Again, not so not so critical. Uh, one thing that's also shown here is that um, you know you have to take into account that the you know human genome is deep deployed, so you've got the heterozygous sites. Uh, you know, so you need to be able to, to call sites that are, you know, knowing that there's actually two, uh, two haplotypes uh, in, in, in the gene. So, anyway, so, you know, not, not too critical. But again, so what is the probability of a given genotype given all of the data we have? Another component that goes into that are these uh, quality scores that I mentioned. So, um, the fact that the particular basis of a low quality is going to be taken into account uh, in the caller. Um, so, so again, I mean, the, the, the purpose of those two slides were just to, to scare you a little bit from looking with, you know, in the algorithm itself. Um, what, what's coming now, so again, I mean, the general principle is really just, you know, you this is a way of integrating all the read information and then giving the a p-value of there's a variant here. Um, so what I think is, is probably more relevant uh, to, to you uh, is, is really looking at what actually is affecting the quality, you know, variant calling. So, so there's, uh, I'm gonna go over four of the things, some of which you actually were doing yesterday um, as, in the mapping step to, to explain how that actually improves and affects variant calling. And in the lab, that's also what we're going to be covering. Also, so local. So I'll, I'll go through them one by one. So local realignment. After you've mapped the reads, um, you know one one step that is usually done is realign the reads uh, locally, right? Because initially, um, so initially all the reads are mapped independently to the genome, uh, and so you get a first mapping of those reads. Uh, but one thing that's uh, been shown is that when you actually have indels, like you have here, um, the mapping of individual reads ends up being imperfect and, and often makes mistakes close to these insertion deletions. Um, so one, one step that's quite important is this indel or, or this local realignment which is typically done around indels or around places where there's lots of variants. So after you've mapped each read individually to the genome, you actually look at all the reads all at once and, and figure out what's the best local mapping of these reads. And you see th the problem is that before the realignment, you actually end up making systematic mistakes in the read alignment that are going to lead to false uh, variant calling, right? These look just like uh, 
uh, well, quite similar to real variants because you've got multiple reads that are saying the same thing, but they're actually all making the same mistakes. Um, so local realignment is, is one step that affects, um, that affects variant calling uh, quite a bit. And, and so in the practical, we'll, we'll actually, I'll, I'll show you the effect of, of uh, that realignment step. Um, so that's one, one thing that's important for variant calling. Another thing that's important uh, for variant calling is, is duplicate marking. Um, so uh, like another thing that can make, uh, so if you don't you know, do this step, uh, you, you might get multiple reads that are actually um, really the same reads that been, that's been PCR amplified, for instance, and that you're, you've got multiple reads that are identical, but bef because you're going to be feeding in how many times did I see this variant into the, the algorithm, um, you're going to think, again, that this is, a, this is a variant, even though it's just the same read that you've read multiple times. Uh, so it's important uh, in the context of variant calling in particular, uh, if you have um, amplified DNA that's been sequenced, uh, to remove reads that are identical with their start and end, as you see here, because you actually only have one observation here. And so you don't want to be uh, you know, pretending or, 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 or sending multiple copies of that that observation to the variant caller because you're likely to get again a uh, false call. Um, so that good question. So for RNA seq, it's uh, it's trickier. There's I mean that's there's so typically you don't want to be removing duplicates because um, for highly expressed gene you might actually get multiple observations that are you know, identical in terms of their start, depending on the type of read that you have. Variance. Well, then, then I would still recommend removing the duplicates, right? So because you would expect or hope to see multiple independent reads covering the variant. Uh, variant calling in, in RNA-seq is actually quite tricky, in, in part because because of the alignment steps. So in RNA-seq data, you have, because of the exon boundaries, this effect happening quite a bit as well, where um, the alignment of RNA-seq reads on the genome uh, around the edges of the exons are very similar to this and sometimes will lead to also false calls. Um, but, but to answer your question, if, I, if to do variant calling in RNA-seq data, I would still then remove the duplicates because you would want to have multiple independent reads supporting that variant because otherwise, you know, I think you... Quantify differences in expression or quantify the expression? Yeah, same thing, I think, because, I, again, for the most part, right, so, I mean, it's only the highly expressed gene that will give you really identical reads, right? So, so by removing the duplicates, what you do is you're actually, you know, are perhaps lowering the expression of the most highly expressed genes because now you've got identical start end uh, repeatedly. But I think that's less of an issue than actually getting, um, you know, false calls and false positives. Um, Okay, so talk, we talked about local realignment, duplicate marking. Uh, another one is base quality recalibration. Um, so, so another thing that's been shown uh, to be important is, is not to trust uh, Illumina, I guess, or, or whatever uh, sequencing company provides you with uh, quality scores. I, I mean, I'm sort of half joking, but it's just, it's been shown that you know, so the instruments makes uh, an estimate of the quality of the reads, but what's been shown is that it makes systematic mistakes. So, um, so depending, so the re based on the reported, the, so they've they've tested and they've shown that the reported quality is tends to be higher uh, than than the actual quality, right? So it's overly optimistic, and that. It's not the end of the world, but the problem is that it's 
overly op optimistic in, in systematic ways as well. So there are, so if you look here, for instance, there are specific uh, types of calls where, again, the, the quality, uh, so specific dinucleotides where the quality score are systematically off. Um, so again, um, so so this this step actually, um, you know, looks at all the reads that are mapped on the genome, looks at known SNPs, and actually adjusts and corrects um, the the quality scores to remove these these artifacts. So again, this is sort of a subtle difference, but it's it's uh, it also improves the variant calling if you adjust the quality scores based on a real uh, you know based on the data itself. Um, so the last uh, the last step that can improve uh, variant calling, uh, and this is, I guess, slightly more advanced and, and maybe not used as much, because for this, you need to know a bit more about the population structure. So I'm putting it here um, to, to, to give you, uh, to, so that at least you know that this, this exists and that this is there. So, you know, everything I've said so far I was really talking about doing variant calling one site at a time, right? You look at one base, you look at how many reads are saying this base is different. Uh, but I have, you know, the first mini practical of the day, I guess. Uh, let's see if you're awake and if the coffee has kicked in. Um, so, I mean, it, as you, as most of you probably know, uh, you know, the, the genome, uh, so we, we all share, uh, you know, blocks of DNA, right? So we inherit blocks of DNA such that uh, everything is in, inherited as haplotype. So you've got real whole blocks of DNA that are uh, that are passed on uh, from generation to generation. So in a popul in a given population, you'll only have a number of haplotypes uh, that are available in that population. So if you have that knowledge that there's only um, these two haplotypes in that particular population, you can use the information about flanking positions to improve your calling at a given position. So if you see that all of your reads at other position, for instance, are this A and G, so can you figure out what is A? That's right. So, so you can, so it's, so this is making use of so you have to make a hypothesis, I guess, in terms of the population structure and things like that, but you can feed that information to actually improve the quality uh, of your calls. And I say that this is a bit more advanced because this is, I mean, again, so, so then you have to make more hypothesis about, about your data. This has a big impact, especially if you have low coverage. So if all you have is 30, you know, 3X or, or, or something like that of your genome, it becomes very difficult uh, to to call positions because you don't have a lot of reads that tell you it's an A or it's a G. So then any trick you can come up with that uses as much information as possible makes a difference. So this, again, if you have low coverage uh, in particular, uh, then using this type of population structure information can help you in variant calling. And again, this is something that in the context of the, the, G, the the GATK uh, framework was shown to have, you know, to, to have a big, in, you know, impact on the, the accuracy. But this, again, is especially when you have um, low, uh, low coverage in your sample. Otherwise, it's not, not nearly as critical. Um, so I've been talking quite a bit about uh, GATK because this is really, in the lab, the, the framework that we'll follow. Um, so, well, so so the the main uh, the main components of that uh, software suite is really you know start so starting from the raw reads you've got this mapping the local uh, realignment and the duplicate marking so again all of this is what you covered yesterday in the context of module two um, I think the the base quality recalibration that I mentioned. Uh, we didn't we didn't do on these sample, uh, but after that um, you've got your your aligned reads, and then you you move on to the variant calling itself, which is uh, what we're going to be in the, doing in the practical um, here. Um, 
again, if you have population information, this is something that you could also add, but we, we won't do this because this is not uh, so much, again, needed if you have high coverage samples. Um, so, so we're going to be working with sort of um, a toy example, so just so that we can actually run things uh, in in the in the lab uh, itself. Um, but I wanted to give you a, some a sense of of what doing it on the on the real whole genome data set would be like. I mean, in the practical, we're only going to be doing this in a very small region of, of chromosome one. Um, it, in, in the real setting, I guess, if you had a whole genome data set, uh, after the alignment, you would have the BAM files. Uh, this typically for a whole genome at 30x is, is roughly in the order of 200 gigs. Uh, so this is, you know, again, you re recalibrated this, the, you've removed the, the, um, the duplicates, and you've done the, the realignment step. Um, so once you have the, the map reads, Doing the variant calling itself, um, you know, would probably take many hours, uh, even on a cluster or, or, you know, with significant resources. Uh, well, you'll see how long it's going to take with just like a tiny region of the genome. You'll see that, I mean, it's, it's going to be quick, but if you were doing it on the whole genome, it would for sure take, uh, take some, some amount of resources. But basically, um, after this step, and so GATK is, is, is really the... The, the, the algorithm or the tool that we're going to be using for this, but but there's other uh, there's other tools that also do you know similar things as as what I you know integrate the information from all the reads in a slightly different way to to call the variants. Uh, SAM tools is another very common one. Freebase is another. Um, so, but after this, um, we actually uh, will get to the the raw variant file, which is this this um, the calls themselves. Um, so, and this is going to be uh, much, much smaller in, in size. Um, so, any questions so far? All good? Um, okay, so, so again, well, just, just to, to reemphasize this, so in the practical, uh, I'll show you how different uh, the variant calls are going to be depending on whether you're doing this correctly or not. So why do the realignment? Why do the duplicate marking at some level? Uh, you'll see how it's going to change a little bit the calls. Um, so but uh, so just we'll, finishing this, um, this introduction before the lab, I guess. Um, so we'll talk now about what do we do once we get this list of variants. So variant filtering and annotation. Um, so the file so the BAM format is the file, the read with the location, right? The, the mapping information. The variants that we're going to get are uh, in the format called the VCF format. Uh, so, so we'll get to see uh, these files. So the VCF format. Um, so there's you know lots of headers. The key thing is that all of the variants that are called uh, are going to be called. You know, you'll have information about the specific position. Um, you know, and then information about what is the reference uh, allele uh, at that position, and then what was the variant that was observed. Uh, and, and importantly, you also get uh, a quality score for the variant. So uh, the output of, um, of, you know, the variant caller uh, is not just a variant, of course, but also a quality score. So this is different than the quality scores of the the individual bases within the read. This is information about how confident uh, the caller observed the variant there, right? So you'll, so it's, um, one, one slightly tricky thing is that um, the quality score varies depend, so the, w the interpretation of these quality scores depends on the aligner that you use, uh, uh, no, sorry, the variant caller that you use. So, the, the, the scale of scores, of course, you know, the higher the better, that doesn't change, but uh, the actual interpretation of these quality score, um, you actually have to look into the variant caller uh, in terms of what, what, um, what it represents. Uh, but so, because one tricky thing is, you know, how do you filter or how, you know, what's a good quality uh, score for the variants? Uh, that's partially defined by 
the variant color that you uh, that you view. Um, and then you have additional information on each of these. But again, so this is going to be a file where every line after the header will be uh, a particular variant with the information uh, on the variant itself. And you know, you know so it, it can get quite complicated in terms of the different, you know, um, the different info fields and things like that. And all the details are in the VCF um, file format that's linked here. Uh, <clears throat> so another, um, so how, so, so typically, especially if you do this whole genome or whole exome, you're going to get a very long list of variants. And, and the first thing that you're going to wonder is how do you filter, how do you select, which ones are the good uh, variants? Um, so there's really two sort of main strategy for this. So you can, you can definitely filter uh, your list of variants um, based on different sort of manual cutoffs, right? You may, you may be, obviously the quality score is an obvious one, right? So maybe you'll say, I only trust um, variants that are above a particular quality score, uh, you, you know, or, or you require a certain depth of coverage, you only trust the variant. So the output is, is really, uh, so anything that's variable will be reported and then uh, it's a question of sort of filtering the, 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 the calls themselves based on quality score and depth of coverage, for instance. Um, I mean, you can do that. And again, it's, it's, it's quite reasonable to say that you want, you know, quality score again above 30 and, and depth of coverage of 10 or something like that to get, uh, it sort of depends on, um, on whether, so if you are looking for a particular variant in a particular gene, maybe you want to have all, everything that's potentially a variant in that gene because you're going to be going through it in detail. Um, if you're doing this genome-wide and you want to start with top candidates, then maybe you want to start with a more uh, a stricter criteria for filtering and then really just saying, I need 10x coverage on that particular variant and I want high, high quality scores. So it really depends on what, what you want to be doing. Um, another uh, quite, uh, well, another I guess nice feature of GATK um, is that it has uh, what's called a variant recalibrator, which is a way of re-ranking or reordering uh, the the calls. So each call was done individually, and again, it produced a score. But one strategy that you can use uh, is you actually feed in to the algorithm um, known uh, known variants, known sites that are variable. So if you, so taking for instance uh, high quality uh, SNPs from the HapMap project, um, so so these are true variable sites in the genome. So if you feed that in um, to the to the algorithm, and you can also feed in in this case. So this, these again are, are the recommendation of the variant recalibrator tool of, of GATK. So you feed in high quality SNPs that are, you know, um, so that you can use um, to basically train the algorithm to see how, how good are my scores or how, you know, how bad are my scores. So you feed in um, these variants to know what you're missing, which should be there. And you feed in, and dbSNP actually contains both very high quality SNPs, but also contains a lot of false positive SNPs. Um, so again, in, in, the, in the context of GATK, using this information to sort of tune its scoring uh, has been shown to actually improve the, the quality score. So um, again, uh, this, this variant recalibrator, all you have to do is to, to be able to use that component of the, of the package is to feed in um, case of, of variants that you expect to have in your sample and variants that potentially contain some false positives. Uh, and it's going to use that to re-rank your variants uh, from high quality to, to lower quality. Um, but again, I mean, this, this is uh, uh, perhaps a bit, uh, a bit tricky, but to go back to, to this, uh, you can use, and, and for the most part, this is fine, 
uh, some manual filtering based on, on some criteria that, that are reasonable to you. Uh, but another option is to, to use a more sort of advanced ranking where you feed in some, uh, some data sets and, and GATK can learn uh, what are the good cutoffs automatically. Yes. That's right. So it it has both very good quality SNPs, but it's also it, within this set there are many false positives. So so the way so he but so within within this what they've shown is that you know SNPs that were in, uh, that are in the half map that are in DB SNP, but things that are only in DB SNP and not in half map are enriched for some systematic false positives that have been observed in the past and have been reported but have never been validated except for that, right? So, so it, it uses that information to know, you know, how many of that particular set am I calling versus how many of the half map SNPs am I calling and then it, it improves the score in the ranking. Um, okay, but, um, but another, another thing, um, so, so this is actually uh, a, an example from, from a project that, that I was part of where we sequenced uh, 100 whole genome um, kidney tumors. And, and even after um, quite, I think, um, good variant calling and stringent filtering, um, we are still left with a lot, a lot of SNPs. Uh, and I, I wanted to show you that just so that uh, you know, you know what you're getting yourself into if you're doing whole genome sequencing and, and you're interested in doing uh, variant calling. So in this case, um, so again, we, this is 100 tumors. Uh, these are the somatic variants or somatic uh, yeah, variants in these 100 tumors. In total, we had more than, than half of a million um, of, of these uh, calls, right? So each of them with, with uh, you know, significant number of, of somatic calls. So even after you have your set of good quality variants, or you know, you need to start annotating them. Um, I don't know why. So on this display, you've got a few things that disappear. But one one key type of annotation, for instance, to begin with, is is the coding mutations, for instance, right? So within this, all of these variants, you want to know which ones are hitting genes. You want to know which ones are, um, are are potentially modifying the coding sequence. Uh, of course, all the other ones are also quite interesting. Um, potentially, the annotation of the non-coding variant is quite tricky. But uh, after the variant calling and the variant filtering, the next step is really annotating. What what you know? Which ones are potentially uh, affecting uh, coding genes, or which ones are potentially affecting enhancer elements and so on. Um, so, so for this, um, there's again a number of tools. The one that we're going to be uh, doing in, in, in the practical is, uh, is SNPF, so SNP effect, so figuring out the effect of SNPs or of uh, mutation. Um, so here you're actually feeding in annotation from the, the reference genome that uh, your sample is, is, is coming from, and it's going to predict the effect on whether it's so it's, if it's a, if it's hitting uh, the, a known gene, uh, whether it's a synonymous, non-synonymous, and so it's going to annotate uh, all of your variant uh, with uh, this kind of basic prioritization. So you'll have, uh, I mean, but this of course, so again, there's lots of tools that do this, and it's not it's not the perfect science. Uh, well. You know whether it's a synonymous or non-synonymous. I mean, some of these things are, are, I guess, more robust for sure. But you still have issues where you have multiple transcripts at a given site. You know, you might. So, I mean, this is uh, this is going to be informative information. But it's uh, there's different ways of, of doing it. Um, so, uh, to continue with this workflow, uh, starting from the uh, the original BAM files. Uh, now we had our, our raw uh, variants. Um, 
So we can use GATK again to filter uh, the variants and, and sort of prioritize them uh, and identify the, the better one. And then we can also use tools like um, SNPF to annotate the variants. Um, and, and this is going to actually give you um, this list of annotated variants, I guess. Yeah. So uh, one thing that's actually quite, so I mean, it's, it's quite subtle, the difference, and it depends on the quality of the sample again. And most of the difference are, especially as I was saying, when you have lower coverage, and there it starts to make more of a difference. Um, one thing that, that we use that I don't have here, but I would re really recommend is that uh, there are some tools that allow you to compare different version. So you, so you download a particular data set and then you can use Freebase to call using whatever set of parameters or you can use GATK and then you can actually compare the results. Um, so I mean again the, the differences will be especially if you're looking at, at low cover uh, sample. Yeah. But I mean there are some I mean, one of the, the, the nice thing about uh, the GATK, you can run it into this, this sort of normal mode that I mentioned, but a lot of this variant recalibration, for instance, and some of these additional more advanced features are, are also quite useful in terms of that. So that the variant calls are... Yeah. Well, yeah, so the question is, um, what would you do if, if you had samples with different coverage, right? Um, I mean, I think, so it depends a little bit on what you do downstream and how you interpret the variant list that you get, right? So if you have a sample that has higher coverage, you do expect to be able to detect more variants. But for mo most purpose, you know, unless what you're interested in is the rate of variance or things like that, typically, you know, you want to extract as much information. And it might be that in that other sample, um, you know, I think it wouldn't be, a, so if you were doing, com doing a comparison of RNA-seq data, that's a much bigger issue because then you're comparing levels, yeah. right? And, and Well, but with RNA-seq, if you're comparing different samples that have very different coverage, it's going to be trickier. There, potentially, downsampling is going to help making a more fair comparison. With the variant calls, if you don't downsample, all you'll have is basically more detection in the sample that have more coverage. And I, you know, I'm not sure that would be a big issue. Well, if, if that's the analysis that you're doing, then yes, you're right. So I think that that's, that's definitely correct. If you're doing a cancer discovery project, um, and, and the main thing is not you know, looking at the total number of variants, but really at the discovery of what kinds of mutations are in your sample, then it would be slightly different and probably wouldn't make sense, I don't think, to that sample. So other questions? So the next step is going to be the lab. So any other questions on the overall workflow and pipeline?